with all that's going on, I do really want to thank you all for making the time to do this um, and to learn more about sort of the history, not just of, of trans folks, but really the challenges that trans folks have faced throughout history um, are really just sort of the canaries in the coal mine for the limitations that have been put on everybody in society um, as a result of gender stereotyping and gender expectations regarding both identity and self-expression. And so just to let you all know a little bit more about Transactive Gender Project, um, we are Portland based. We're based at the Graduate School of Education and Counseling at Lewis and Clark. And the focus of our project completely is on gender diversity, gender expansiveness, trans identity, gender nonconformity, gender fluidity, gender, gender awesomeness, um, non-binary um, uh, issues as, as they primarily impact children, youth, and their families, right? We also do work and do advocacy, support, and education work that impacts adults as well. But the primary focus is on how these things are impacting children and youth in our society. And we are part of the Center for Community Engagement at the Graduate School. And so if you'd like more information about uh, CCE's offerings, please go to Lewis and Clark um, it's lclark.edu and click on graduate school and continuing education and you can get more information there. I want to acknowledge um, several folks and researchers specifically that have done a great deal of work on recording and identifying and digging up um, obscure trans history, lost, almost lost trans history, um, and whose information and materials to some extent I quote throughout the, throughout the presentation. And as a former presidential candidate once said to paraphrase, it takes a whole village. And in this case, it takes a whole village to tell our story. So I want to thank Hal Pruden, Joan Ruffgard, and Monica Roberts, and Susan Stryker. Before we go any further, I think it's because we're talking about the history um, of this land, and particularly as it impacts gender diverse people and trans people, um, as always, I think it's very important to acknowledge that we are on someone else's land. We are on land that was populated and civilized and uh, celebrated um, for many, 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 many centuries prior to uh, people that look like me um, arriving in this space. And so um, we acknowledge the indigenous tribes and people impacted by practices of genocide and colonization and on whose traditional and ancestral land we sit. We acknowledge the ancestors and survivors of this place and recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. And we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants who are continuing to carry on tribal traditions for present and future generations. A heads up to everybody, it is impossible. I have tried for many years it is impossible to discuss the reasons for resistance to or oppression of gender diversity without referencing religion in some aspect. And so to the best of my ability, we will talk about what the impacts of that have been and continue to be on these populations on, on transgender people and gender diverse people, et cetera. This is at no point and no time meant to be an overall um, condemnation um, or criticism of religious faith in general. However, there are certain um, aspects of people's practice of religious faith that have been destructive and oppressive to non-believers. And so it is with that intent that we move forward. When European colonization of the Americas began, there were at least 18 million indigenous people living north of the Rio Grande and south of the Canadian border. Though many immigrated to the New World to escape religious persecution, it took only a few decades for them to begin evangelizing Christian beliefs and moralities on the original people they encountered. 
Most native societies already had sophisticated social structures with ancient faith and worship traditions of their own. Among the belief systems in many tribes and cultures was the recognition of up to five gender roles. Male, female, two-spirit male, two-spirit female, and the equivalent of transgender. So long as idleness is quite shut out from our lives, all the sins of wantonness, softness, and effeminacy are prevented, and there is but little room for temptation. Jeremy Taylor, 17th Century Cleric. In 1512, Spanish conquistador Vasco Nunez de Balboa threw 40 Indian two-spirit people into pits with his war dogs, where they were torn limb from limb. According to a historian of the time, Balboa did this because he became upset with their effeminate dress and behavior. Christian missionaries were shocked to learn of women warriors and matrilineal tribal heritage. Through religious indoctrination and forced assimilation, misogynistic and patriarchal social structures gradually overwhelmed these centuries-old native traditions, spreading north, south, and west as endless waves of European immigrants arrived. This is one of the most unaccountable and disgusting customs that I have ever met in the Indian country, and so far as I have been able to learn, belongs only to the Sioux and Sac and Foxes. Perhaps it is practiced by other tribes, but I did not meet with it, and where I should wish that it might be extinguished before it could be more fully recorded. George Catlin, 19th century painter, author, and historian. So, um, these are all North American, primarily um, indigenous tribes, each of which had their own multi-gender beyond the binary traditions. Um, and I won't go through the whole list, but it's a pretty comprehensive list of the tribal nations that existed here. And as those cultures began reclaiming um, this historical tradition that they had um, out of respect to the two-spirit um, or to the multi-gendered folks that still exist within those tribes, they realized that trying to get white society, non-native society, to understand this, it would be, it would be difficult if almost impossible if they were using a hundred different words to describe a very similar experience. So in 1990, in a national um, conference or convention of tribal nations um, in Winnipeg, Canada, they decided to condense all of those different names into the term two-spirit as a way of unifying various gender identities and expressions. And um, that's where two-spirit came from. It wasn't assigned to them by any white researcher or any white folks. Um, it was a decision by the tribal nations to condense all the different words to that. Um, Two-Spirit is not a contemporary New Age movement. Um, it's not a variation on est, right, um, or anything like that. Um, and Two-Spirit pe people uh, have both a masculine and feminine spirit within them, um, and they're blessed by their creator, and this is how the uh, indigenous folks saw this, this is a blessing by their creator to be able to see the life through the eyes of many genders. Now you notice we use the term masculine and feminine as opposed to male and female because we're talking about energies, right? We're talking about spectrums. Um, and 
all people exist and have experiences that can be on both the masculine and the feminine spectrum to differing degrees. But in its original tradition, the used two spirit was not a referral to or was not related to sexual orientation. It was specifically about the masculine feminine roles and identities and self-expression that folks played in their tribes. In 1863, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors passed a law making it a crime for a person to appear in public, in dress not belonging to his or her sex. This occurred in the context of broad indecency laws that criminalized public nudity, indecent exposure, lewd acts, and immoral performances. Similar laws were passed in more than 40 U.S. cities between the Civil War and World War I. Many of these laws remained in force until the 1970s. Police departments use cross-dressing laws to harass queer and transgender communities through most of the 20th century during bar raids that were unsuccessful in catching customers soliciting or having sex. Those arrested faced public exposure, police harassment, and imprisonment. By the start of the 20th century, they also risked psychiatric institutionalization or deportation if not a U.S. citizen. Author, Claire Sears. In October of 1890, a judge in San Francisco sentenced Mamie Rubel, who preferred the name Dick, to the state insane asylum because of a hallucination that she should wear men's clothing and wants legal authority for doing so. The case took a dramatic twist in court when Rubel refused to identify with available gender categories and explained to the judge, I'm neither a man nor a woman and I've got no sex at all. cross-dressing laws did more than ban a set of clothing. It effectively outlawed the existence of gender-diverse human beings. The impact of cross-dressing laws on gender variance and public space was consequential, not only for those marked as criminals, but also for the gender-normative public, which now faced an artificially narrowed range of gender identity and gender expression in public life. And in 1845, New York became the first state to officially um, criminalize cross-dressing. Um, but it didn't start out as a law against cross-dressing. In 1845, a law was created that declared it was a crime to have your face painted, discolored, covered, or concealed, or in any way be otherwise disguised while in a road or a public highway. The state intended the law to punish rural farmers um, because apparently they had been disguising themselves as Native Americans to get out of paying taxes. Um, however, by the beginning of the 20th century, gender inappropriateness, which is often what it was referred to, was now becoming considered a moral failure, a sickness, and a public offense. Um, this was probably very, most well um, established um, in a, actually a 20th century case in 1913, uh, a young woman named Elizabeth Trondle, um, who even though the term didn't con exist then, what we would consider today to be a transgender person, um, a transgender man, was arrested for masquerading in men's clothing.
and this is a quote from the sitting magistrate. I sent her to the Bedford Reformatory for three years because I believe she is a moral pervert. No girl would dress in men's clothing unless she is twisted in her moral viewpoint. Now, another aspect of this is that she was originally arrested for dressing in men's clothing. And she went before a judge to hear her case, <clears throat> initially a judge to hear her case. And the judge asked why she had been arrested. And the arresting officer said, well, because she's dressing like a man. She was in a bar smoking in the back and talking to men. Um, and that judge said, well, that's not a crime. She can dress, people can dress any way they want to. Like 1913, this judge was like pretty woke um, and said, well, that's, that's not a crime. Did she commit a crime? I mean, she said, uh, the judge said, perhaps that's not the way we'd like our daughters to act, but it's not a crime. And so the judge dismissed the case. The following day, the district attorney said, no, we got to get her on something. So they charged her again with vagrancy, public vagrancy, and brought her back into the court. And that was what she was being tried for, even though the underlying um, offense, as it were, was dressing as a man. Elizabeth Trondle wrote a letter to President Woodrow Wilson asking for assistance on this. <clears throat> and this is the letter, Dear Mr. Wilson, I am a woman in trouble and I want my rights. It is no crime for a female to wear male attire, and yet I have been arrested here in Brooklyn for doing it. I want a permit from you or someone else to wear the costume I have adopted. I am tired of being kicked around and abused and poorly paid. If I can appear as a man and do man's work, I shall be more respected, better paid, and happier. Won't you please see what can be done for me? Uh, that's a pretty suffragette, feminist, liberationist, um, I would be happy to copy that letter from 1913 to send to a certain occupant of the White House today. Um, so, and here's the other thing about Elizabeth Trondle. She was 17 years old when she wrote this letter. So this was a 17 year old, what we would consider today to be trans person, tilting at the giant windmill of an oppressive early 20th century government system um, doing their best, doing his best to advocate for his own rights. So now what happens? So prior to really the industrial period, prior to the later part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, everything that we knew was kind of, laws were based on morals, right? Um, we didn't really know much about the science of what makes us us, right? And once we started learning more and more about that, it became more and more important for laws and lawmakers and societies in general to incorporate that into their uh, ways of treating each other to a greater or lesser extent. So there's an amazing man named Magnus Hirschfeld. I was born in 1868. And he is in many ways the founding person of um, what we would now call LGBTQ uh, liberation, um, inclusion, things like that. In 1897, um, Magnus Hirschfeld was German, he lived in Germany. Um, he founded something called the Scientific Humanitarian Committee. Um, and it was specifically to campaign for social recognition of homosexuals and transvestites, which was the only term that existed at the time for people that, that cross-dressed. Um, and against their legal persecution. It is the first LGBT rights organization in history. About 20 years later or so, he founded the Institute for Sexual Science, also in Berlin, Germany. And this was the first institute in the world that was focused specifically on 
the, on sexuality and the science behind why people like who they like and why people identify as who they are based on additional information that was coming in through scientific channels um, and trying to put make this a field of study. So sexology, um, gender diverse psychology, um, all of these fields that came afterwards did not exist prior to the founding of the Institute for Sexual Science. And in 1923, Hirschfeld was the first person to use the German transsexualismus, I think is the German word for it, um, to created the term transsexualism, identifying a new clinical care category for people who had previously just been lumped in with homosexuals, right, um, for people that did not identify or experience themselves to be the sex or gender they were assigned at birth. And so he created that term, which was later then taken up and used um, and popularized by a, another colleague of his name, Harry Benjamin. We move into a very dark period um, for the world at this point in time, and it's important that we understand specifically what happened um, in the realm of, of gender diverse people and Tahan's uh, um, Magnus Hirschfeld. So that's a picture of the sexual, uh, Institute for Sexual Science in Berlin from um, the early 1900s. And it was visited by around 20,000 people each year. As soon as it was founded, there, was, there were all these people that previously had nowhere to go to talk about things that many people considered to be unspeakable. Um, and they conducted about 1,800 consultations. Um, people that could not afford to pay were treated for free. And the Institute in, advocated specifically for sex education, contraception, treatment of STDs, and was a very early supporter of um, women's suffrage and emancipation. It was a center for researchers as well. Um, folks that were interested in this field of study, were interested in actually making this a field of study, came to the Institute for Sexual Science. Um, and it also became, um, and, those, and, and that became uh, integrally intertwined with political and social reformers on social justice issues. Uh, folks began to see the interconnection between oppression of these folks and lack of information um, about these folks. Um, and so this became a real kind of hotbed for this. Here's an actual period uh, picture of a costume party held at the Institute and Magnus Hirschfeld is the second gentleman from the uh, second person from the right um, sitting down with the big walrus mustache. And so these are some of the people that were very important in what I, what I call the trans first generation. And two of these folks are a woman named Dora Richter and Tori Abel. Uh, in 1931, as you can see, Dora Richter became the first person to have anything closely resembling what we would consider to be, um, we now call gender confirmation surgery or gender affirmation surgery. It has also been called sexual reassignment surgery. Um, in the vernacular, um, people have shorthanded it to be referred to it as sex change, um, which by the way, don't use that term. <laughs> but uh, it was called that uh, for a, a very long time. And Dora Richter was really the first person to have that in 1931. It was Magnus Hirschfeld who helped Dora Richter obtain a permit to wear women's clothes because it was illegal to cross dress. And um, Dora, um, Magnus Hirschfeld also employed her at the Institute for Sexual Science in Berlin. Um, she was not the only one. Um, she, he had five and maybe more employees, um, including another woman that you see pictured here, Tor, Tony Abel, um, and another woman, Carla von Christ at the Institute. And they couldn't find employment anywhere else. So they were employed there. They were treated entirely as women. Um, this was a recognition that Magnus Hirschfeld and the Institute saw that the social implications of oppression and rejection was at least as important, if not more important, than the physical treatment and physical um, uh, challenges um, that trans people experienced. Um, happily, Tony Abel um, survived that very dark period in the world, and particularly in, in Nazi Germany, and died at the age of 80 in 1961.
about another trans first generation person that many of you may be more familiar with, primarily because there was a movie made about her life that was, um, yeah, was probably about 28% true and the rest was sort of a mythology. But in the same year, but a few weeks after Dora Richter's surgery, uh, a woman named Lily Elb became the second recipient of vaginoplasty surgery. And eventually she became the first recipient of experimental um, ovarian transplant and uterus transplant surgery. Unfortunately, her immune system rejected the transplant. Um, she'd been doing fine before the second surgery and a surgical revision caused infection and which led to her death because antibiotics had not yet been created. So they were doing these complex surgeries in a time where um, we had no way of responding if infection ensued. Um, and as you can see on the right, the film that I was referring to, it's also a book. The book is very good. So is the film, but they're not fully true. Um, was the Danish girl. Referring to the permit piece, um, I don't know if you remember, but back to the video about um, the criminalization, the video that I showed you. Um, at the very end, um, there was a, a, some text there that said that these um, anti-cross-dressing laws existed in many American cities up until the 1970s. So I'm a trans woman. Um, I transitioned when I was very young. Um, young for then, not young for now, um, but young for then. I transitioned when I was 20 years old. And at that time, um, I had to carry a letter with me that said that I was under a doctor's care, um, that I was transsexual, and as part of my treatment, I was required to dress and live and work um, as a woman um, for a minimum of 12 months. And I had to carry that letter with me in case I ever got stopped by the police. So among the many atrocities and um, horrifying things that resulted from um, the rise of National Socialism um, and the Nazi Party in Germany in the 30s, um, the destruction of all this material since Germany pr prior to the Nazis was really the center of all this really kind of enlightened forward thinking, both on the medical front and on the social justice and advocacy front and legal front. Um, this was all lost on May 10th, 1933, which is why there's, a, there's this pretty big gap between what was happening in the 20s and beginning to emerge in the early 30s around taking a more scientific medical informed approach to gender diversity. There's this huge gap between then and the 1950s. Um, there were some scientific developments that happened that were significant. We were able to isolate hormones for the first time in the 1930s and 1940s, which became very um, isolate and then synthetically recreate hormones, which became a very important aspect of working with, treating, um, helping, transgender, gender diverse folks, as well as women with menopause and men with low testosterone. So let's jump forward to the 50s. A 26-year-old ex-GI arrives home from Denmark where doctors converted him into a woman. 
Two years ago, the name was George Jorgensen. Today, it's Christine. Have you been offered a movie contract? Yes, but I haven't accepted it. Do you, uh, do you have any plans regarding the theater? No, I don't think so. And Christine! Uh, are you going Christine. to go on with your photography? I hope so, yes. I see. Yeah. Thank you very much. Christine! Oh, wait, wait, wait. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have any plans at the moment, and I thank you all for coming, but I think it's too much. Fine, thank you very much. Christine Jorgensen was probably the single most influential transgender person um, in the history of modern history of awareness of gender diverse identity and certainly transgender people or at the time people uh, the term was transsexual people um, and that was mostly due to the times in which she was born and the times in which she transitioned it was a time in which television was really moving into everyone's homes just so many different ways of communicating her story when her story broke um, she was not as you know from now, she was not the first person to have this surgery. She wasn't a man or woman. She wasn't the first. But hers was the story that um, really sort of woke the world up to this, right? For my generation, and I consider myself to be the, the cusp of transgeneration to but also kind of early in Transgeneration 3, um, Christine Jorgensen changed and saved my life. And when I say that, I am speaking for tens of thousands of other trans people as well. Um, hundreds of thousands, if you probably consider those that have since passed on. Um, simply because what Christine Jorgensen represented for everybody else who had feelings similar to hers was that you weren't alone. There's another person out there. But Christine Jorgensen's visibility um, was also the start of, now we've invited the whole world in to have this conversation with us about gender identity and gender diversity. And what does it mean to the world? What does it mean for our understanding of gender? And it opened a whole, whole new fields of study and but also fields of speculation and criticism. Time magazine, which originally had been very supportive of Christine and it immediately used, started using female pronouns to refer to her, um, stopped using female pronouns to describe her in its news coverage. And that um, editorial decision by Time magazine began to be reflected and set the stage for, in many ways, the way the media still refers to trans people, right? Is that not necessarily adopting the pronoun that matches their identity. But it raised the questions that, well, we thought it was pretty simple before. There was Genesis, there was man, there was woman. Um, so now what does, the, what does sexuality mean? And so then as, um, and as it, Christine was not gay, Christine did not identify as lesbian, she was heterosexual. Um, so then the shift in talking about whether or not she was going to get, everybody was very, it was very titillating before. Oh, is there a man in your life? Oh, is this going to be, suddenly it turned to, well, is Christine actually a homosexual transvestite or is she a heterosexual woman? Which of those two things is she? I don't know. At the same time that Christine Jorgensen's story broke, then we touched on this shortly thereafter, a story broke was uh, in Jet Magazine, which was read primarily by black people. Um, it was a great magazine. It was like a little small pamphlet almost like thing. But I remember seeing and reading Jet when I was a kid. 
uh, and a teen and a young adult in the uh, 60s and early 70s. Um, and a story broke in the June 18th, 1953 issue of Jet. A 26-year-old shake dancer and professional female impersonator announced their plans to go to Europe in August for an operation to become a woman so that he can marry a U.S. Army sergeant. So there's a lot to unpack in that whole, the way that whole story is framed there, right? The story goes on to say, if Brown's plans are realized, he, and here they're using the male pronoun, he will become the first Negro transvestite, transvestite in history to transform his sex. Now, we have no way of knowing if that's true, uh, because as um, Demetra previously said, there may have been people before this, right? But this was the first documented story that I've been able to find, um, or that we researchers have been able to find, of African-American people, trans people stories being told in public. That's a picture of Carlette. Um, they only provided in the article, they only provided a, a male picture. That picture on the cover of Jet was not Carlette. That was somebody else, um, just so you know. Uh, unfortunately, after Christine Jorgensen, um, whose surgery happened in Denmark, the De uh, Denmark was, and the surgeons there were inundated with requests from people all over the world. I'm like Christine, I wanna come there, I wanna get this surgery. And as a result, um, the Danish government said that from this point forward, only people that were Danish citizens were eligible to have this surgery done. Christine, by the way, was a Danish citizen um, through her mother. She had dual citizenship, U.S. and Danish. Um, and so in order to meet that qualification, Carlette Brown said, okay, I'll renounce my U.S. citizenship and I'll become a Danish citizen. That's how important this was to her, right? However, the government told her that she wouldn't be allowed to leave the U.S. until she paid $1,200 in back taxes. So Carlette Brown Angeli took a job uh, at Iowa State College at a, in a fraternity to earn money to pay off her debt. She did odd jobs around there, kept the frat house clean, things like that, um, to try to pay off her debt so she could go to Denmark. And unfortunately, nothing knows, more is known of her. Uh, there were no follow-up stories. We don't know if she ever paid off her debt. We don't know whether she ever got to Denmark for her surgery. Because like many black stories, her history didn't make it, that history didn't make it forward to our present, right? Because nobody paid attention. So anybody not heard of Stonewall? What a lot of people don't know is that most well, most bars, but certainly most gay bars at the time were run and owned by the mafia. Um, and those bars paid bribes to the cops so that the cops wouldn't raid the bars and interrupt all their patrons and throw them out and arrest them. And the Stonewall Inn um, had gotten behind in their bribe payments to the cops. And so the cops raided the Stonewall. And on this particular first night of the riots, they actually occurred over three nights, <clears throat> um, the drag queens, the gender nonconformists, the early trans folks <clears throat> just had enough and they rebelled. Um, there are differing stories on who um, fought back first, um, whether or not it was um, a, a drag queen or a trans person. Um, there are people that say that it was actually a Butch Dyke that was the first person. Um, I don't know, but somebody threw something at one of the cops. Um, some say it was a high heel shoe and um, Stonewall happened. And from that, something called the Gay Liberation Front was formed and GLF groups all around the nation were formed on college campuses and in cities and towns. And this was really, although this wasn't the first social um, protest uprising um, by trans or LGBTQ people. Um, there were earlier ones at Compton's Cafeteria in San Francisco and in Philadelphia. Um, this was the one that got the most attention because of course it was in New York City, right? But this was the spark that started um, the movement towards LGBTQ equality. So, <clears throat> Trans movements, trans history, trans awareness, trans um, 
protests and social action were not well known. They were really lost um, in all of the space that um, primarily the white gay liberation, white male gay liberation movement had taken up. But in 1970, an organization called STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, was co-founded by two women of color, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. Um, again, two women of color um, doing something revolutionary and incredibly progressive and not really being recognized for it or talked about it in the media or anything. Um, and one of the things, talk about intersecting oppressions, one of the things that um, made them being more visible a, a problematic for some people was that they funded their work primarily through the sex work that they did. They were both sex workers um, and small donations that people would give. Um, and they focused in the early 1970s on the intersectional oppression in ways that the predominantly white gay male post Stonewall um, organizations weren't focusing on. And they also used these funds and did their work to provide housing for homeless trans youth. This was at a time when very few people even knew that trans youth existed, right? And they, but in New York, they had a lot of interaction with homeless trans youth and they knew that they needed safe, safe harbors. In 1971, a gay rights organization called the Gay Activist Alliance, GAA, introduced a municipal bill <clears throat> seeking uh, civil rights protections um, against discrimination based on sexual orientation. Well, the, they did not, in their conversations with the government, they did not include protections for trans people or queens or things like that. So the members of STAR, um, particularly Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, um, and another organization called the Queens Liberation Front, were very critical of GAA for ignoring protections for trans individuals. Um, and they believed it was an intentional move to ensure the bill's passage. And unfortunately, that exact same strategy was played out in 2007 by the Human Rights Campaign at a time when an equal rights amendment was trying to move forward through, this, through the House and the Senate um, that would provide protections for LGB people. Um, and the Human Rights Campaign, which was the leading social justice organization that was working with the Congress at that time, made the decision at the last minute, by the way, to compromise and say, okay, well, we're gonna take protections for trans people out of this in the hopes that you will go ahead and pass this bill. As it turns out, they didn't pass the bill anyway. Right? So this history of um, what we think of as this LGBTQ, arms linked together, community all moving forward together equally and things like that has not really been true. And it's one of the reasons why I refer to LGBTQ as a group, as a population acronym, as opposed to a community acronym. So what about trans men? Talk about Christine Jorgensen and Carlette Brown Angeli and Lily Elb and Dora Richter and uh, do trans men even exist? Well, yes. Um, one of the very first trans men to get any type of surgery or treatment um, happened in the late 1940s. His name was Michael Dillon. Um, and he was a um, physician in England. Um, and he had early treatment. He was one of the first people to get testosterone treatment. And this was shortly after we were able to synthesize testosterone um, and use it as a treatment protocol. Um, but until recently, the cultural obsession was with trans women. Trans men fairly easily in many instances disappeared into the fabric of society. Um, their stories weren't really being told. Um, and the reason that there was more fascination with trans women, I think, um, is due to the fact that people in a misogynistic patriarchal culture people found it so much more transgressive that someone born into a position of greater privilege would voluntarily relinquish that to move into the second class group, right? Um, and then there was the way that we objectified women anyway. So then it was all about, oh, well, if they're in the second group now, do they have boobs? I mean, how pretty are they? Um, 
we, you know, the objectification, um, the trans objectification and trans misogyny was pretty profound and continues to be pretty profound. But these are just some of the, some of the early trans men that really, um, that either wrote books or were in the news or that were um, having court cases that were being judged. Dr. Steve Dane was a, was declared um, prior to their transition teacher of the year in the state of California. And then after his transition, he was fired and never worked again as a public school teacher. He took the case to court, he lost. Um, and, um, but these are just some of the, some of the trans men that were writing books. Mario, um, Mario Martino's real name was Angela Tornabene, um, wrote a wonderful book. So I wanna talk a little bit about one of those folks in particular, um, and that's Lou Sullivan. Um, and he was the founder of FTM International, and FTM is an acronym for a term that's commonly used, but not um, in some circles isn't considered politically correct or, or really um, a good dis describer of the experience. Um, but FTM is an acronym for female to male individuals. Um, and he founded an organization called FTM International and they published a newsletter, FTM newsletter, which was widely read by trans men. And he really was one of the people that brought um, trans men into the LGBTQ equality, visibility, equity conversation. Um, Lou uh, played a very instrumental role in persuading medical and psychotherapeutic professionals to provide trans, uh, to provide services to trans people and think back to the question about what if Christine had come out as lesbian also, um, to trans people who identified as gay or lesbian. Lou Sullivan was a gay trans man and that was a no-no, right? Um, so if a trans man um, went to their doctor and said, I was assigned female at birth, but I identify as a man, I want to transition to being a man, and when I do, I'm going to be a gay man, they would be denied, be denied access to care. They would be judged to be mentally disturbed. Lou, uh, unfortunately, because it was the 80s, um, Lou lived in San Francisco, but he could have lived anywhere. Um, and Lou, um, was diagnosed with HIV. And after being diagnosed with HIV, he made this, he said this quote, I took a certain pleasure in informing the gender clinic that even though their program told me I could not live as a gay man, it looks like I'm going to die like one. And that was a ref reference to the assumption um, at that time that only gay men got AIDS and died from AIDS. He was the first transgender man to publicly identify as gay and is largely responsible for modern understanding that sexual orientation and gender identity are distinct, somewhat unrelated concepts. I also want to say that Lou Sullivan was just a terrific guy. Uh, he, he was a friend and he was a terrific human being. It's, you know, sometimes when we talk about historical figures, um, having met Christine Jorgensen and come to know her somewhat, um, it's very easy for people to forget that these were real human beings with real feelings and that they had um, more scope to their lives than simply the icon of the movement that they came to be known for. And so, miss you, Lou. Richards has become the source of international and national controversy over the past week or two. A cause celeb. The reason? Is she male or is she female? She is a transsexual. Two years ago, she was Dr. Richard Raskin and was ranked nationally among the top 20 male tennis players over age 35. It's just overpowering all the other stories and how many transsexuals were in the world at the time. And it just so happens one of them is a professional tennis player. It's like, what are the odds, you know? I said to her, what do you call yourself? Transgender, transsexual? I'm a woman like everyone else. Ask me how the match went instead. You know, how in the world did this happen? This might incentivize more guys to turn into girls or something. Should she be allowed to play against women opponents? It was big news, you know, it was sensational. She beat somebody who said afterwards it wasn't fair, I was playing a guy, you know. Her next opponent walked off the court, wouldn't even finish the match. Some of the lesser players were getting all up in arms and they almost on a strike mode. I think what they are afraid of is the unknown. 
her size, six feet one, and her skill have threatened other female players. You know, what if she comes on and becomes number one? You got, are we all going to be able to handle that? And so while you, while you read that, um, this was sort of the first um, case in which this conversation about athletic competition between trans women, and the focus was almost exclusively on trans women, it still is to this day, um, athletic competition between trans women and cisgender or uh, non-transgender girls or women um, was, well, well, they're going to have an automatic physical advantage and they're going to dominate every single sport. And you heard, you know, John McEnroe, who was an amazing tennis player, but is a complete idiot in actual life. Um, again, kind of proposed the, the, this, uh, this red herring. Well, are a bunch of guys just going to change their sex now and change their gender so they can win competitions? Um, which is really, I mean... You know, I have a sense of how much men sort of value their parts and stuff. I, I really don't see that happening. Um, we haven't seen that happening that much. But anyway, so she was thrust into the spotlight. This became a big national conversation. Um, and initially they denied her the opportunity to compete and she took them to court. And the court said, well, she's recognized as female in the eyes of the law. Um, and the doctors tell us that she does not have a physical advantage, so she can compete. End of story, right? Despite these irrational fears that Renee would dominate women's pro tennis, she was at best, at the professional top level of women's sports, she was at best an average ten tennis player, and she never beat any of the top-ranked women, ever. She never beat Chrissy Everett, she never beat Martina Navratilova, she never be Billie Jean King, she wasn't even close to being good enough to play them. And speculation that the Rich Richards case would result in an influx of men claiming to be trans so they could dominate field competition, female competition never happened. And it's not happening today. You wouldn't know that by a lot of the rhetoric and even political campaign talk. All female athletes want is a fair shot in competition at a scholarship, at a title, at victory. What if that shot was taken away by a competitor who claims they're a girl but was born a boy? Andy Bashir supports legislation that would destroy girls' sports. He calls it equality. Maybe, but is it fair? Vote against Andy Bashir. He's too extreme for Kentucky. There's little incentive for trans athletes to even compete anymore. And because I work primarily with children and youth, right? So I work with trans kids. I work with trans kids that have transitioned as young as four and five years old. And I've done this work for going on 15 years now. And I've literally, I know hundreds of these kids and I know their families. And some of these kids that we started working with and getting to know when they were five years old are now graduating from high school. And they underwent treatment called pubertal suppression treatment, which meant they never went through a, a male or masculine puberty. Their bodies never masculinized. Um, and many of these kids um, and youth that didn't have that advantage but are still trans um, are forego athletic competition because of this last paragraph. There's a little incentive for them to compete. If they're too good, people will accuse them of having an unfair advantage, right? So it seems like the only acceptable way for a trans athlete to perform or to compete is to limit them in doing so in a mediocre way. Um, so in 1979, a book was published called The Transsexual Am Empire. The author was Janice Raymond. Um, and this was the first book that came from a very anti-trans critical feminist perspective. Um, or specifically anti-transsexual feminist, and those three words have to be together. Not, not from an entirely all-feminist perspective, but anti-transsexual feminist perspective. 
Um, and this had been developing at the grassroots level for quite a while, but Raymond's book was the first one that really addressed this. And she argued that transsexuals were simply mindless agents of a nefarious patriarchal conspiracy bent on the destruction of women. Now, we're all very familiar with wacko conspiracy theories these days. This was one of the early ones around trans women. Um, and to explain that more clearly, her argument and the anti-trans feminist argument was that the patriarchy had come up with a plan to have men transition to become women, including surgery and such, in order to infiltrate women's spaces and then destroy those women's spaces from within, all while remaining men. Well, <laughs> quote, all transsexuals rape women's bodies by reducing the real female form to an artifact, appropriating this body for themselves. Transsexuals merely cut off the most obvious means of invading women, i.e. the penis, so that they seem non-invasive, close quote. That's from Raymond's book. Raymond also characterized trans men as traitors, trans men as traitors to their sex. So why aren't they just butch lesbians? Why are they pretending to be men? Why are they selling out butch lesbianism um, and to the cause of feminism? And they portrayed trans women as rapists engaged in unwanted penetration of women's spaces. She suggested that transsexuals be morally mandated out of existence. It's pretty strong stuff. This strategy of oppression has been adopted by religious extremists, trans exclusionary radical feminists and alt-right politicians for more than 30 years since the publication of this book for sure, going on 40 years now, and is the basis in many ways for JK Rowling's fall from grace and many of the opinions that she's expressing now. Jen, can I ask a, just a question about JK Rowling? I've, I've been, yeah. um, well, you know, she was definitely an author that I admired and mm -hmm. I loved how she treated so many different, uh, different dimensions of humanity with, with empathy and kindness. And I have to say, I've just been horrified um, about her transphobia in, in it. I, I guess I, I don't, I don't think I really knew her. Um, and it's been, really confusing to understand where it's been coming from. And I know probably others on this call have read a lot more about, about her and her ideologies. But anyways, it was a, it's just been a huge source of uh, sadness and disappointment yeah. and probably necessary to distance from her, her creativity because of these beliefs. The, the primary foundation for her sort of visible uh, transphobia is a growing, and this particularly directly impacts the work that we do at Transactive because it directly impacts the population we most specifically work with, trans children, youth, and their families, is that the primary reason why she emerged, um, her transphobia emerged, is that she kind of latched on to um, a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there about early therapeutic and medical intervention for trans kids. So her main objections were pubertal suppression treatment for trans kids, um, and then hormone treatment for trans kids or trans teens. Um, first of all, when I say trans kids, I mean adolescents or teens. Nobody's giving any hormones or anything to children. There's, that's not happening, but they want you to think that's what's happening. They want you to think six-year-olds are getting hormones or six-year-olds are having their puberty suppressed. There's no puberty happening at six years old to suppress. So that's not happening. Ah, remember that sound? Any of you? Some of you may not even be old enough to remember that sound. Oh yeah. But that's how we all connected to the internet in the early years. Um, and the internet was a huge development in the, in, in the establishment of community and, and communications of gender diverse and trans people. Um, truly, without the internet, this concept of a trans community 
um, would not really have even been possible or certainly wouldn't have been established in the 90s when it was. Um, and with that power to share, um, uh, with that information and ability to organize came more power. Oh yeah, we think alike on this, we think alike, let's get together, let's write a letter, let's contact our congressperson, let's do that. That was not possible prior to the internet. Um, it brought enlightenment, enlightenment empowerment, um, but also obviously as it did with everything, the internet can inform or it can exploit, right? Um, and we see plenty of examples of that today. And it made education, outreach, and connections for youth and families of gender diverse kids um, possible. Um, they simply had no way of knowing each other existed. Also in 1994, an organization called the Transsexual Menace was founded by Ricky Ann Wilkins. Um, and it tapped into the fact that in addition to wanting to be involved in movements that educated and informed people about gender diversity and sexual orientation, um, there was a lot of growing anger about the violence that was being perpetrated, um, specifically on trans people who were not part of the national conversation on gay rights at this time. And so she founded the transsexual menace in the aftermath of the murder of Brandon and Tina and two of his friends um, that was uh, commemorated in the film, um, Boys Don't Cry. For those that haven't seen it, that was the Brandon and Tina story. Um, and Shortly thereafter, Gwen Smith um, founded, uh, created the Remembering Our Dead project um, to document and honor the memory of transgender murder victims around the world. As of this morning, um, 26 people that we know of have been murdered in 2020, specifically for being trans, and most of those murdered have been trans women of color. Um, this will probably be the record year for documented murders of trans people and certainly trans women of color. Um, but the numbers are probably significantly higher than that because families don't often report that they're, the person that died was trans or identified as trans. Um, sometimes bodies aren't even found, right? So um, we have an epidemic of murder against trans identified people and it most specifically impacts populations of color, particularly black women. At the time that story broke, I had just about a month before found a Yahoo, stumbled into a Yahoo chat group that consisted specifically of parents and caregivers of transgender children. And the primary conversation in that whole group was that each family, even though now they knew that each other existed in a cyber sense, um, none of the gay rights movements, none of the gay rights organizations, there were no organizations specifically designed to serve the needs of transgender, gender diverse, gender nonconforming children youth and their families. The gay rights organizations were all focused on adult issues. And I was part of that group. I saw this story. Um, this story became a huge conversation piece in that group. Um, it enraged me. And being a child of the 60s, I made the mistake of saying, gee, someone ought to start an organization that works specifically with families of transgender children and youth. Um, and they all looked at me and said, that's a great idea, Jen. You should do that. Um, and at that point, 2006, um, I co-founded with a couple of a group called Trans Kids Family Coalition. And that was the very first organization in the country that specifically focused on education, advocacy, and support for transgender children um, and youth and their families. Uh, that group changed its name relatively soon after that to Trans Youth Family Advocates and then Trans Youth Family Alley. I left that organization in 2007 and founded Gender Center uh, based here in Portland with the intention of more robust direct services as opposed to internet based uh, support systems and connected connections. And we operated as Transactive Gender Center for about 13 years. And then in February of 2019, we uh, became part of the Graduate School of Education and Counseling at Lewis and Clark. Um, it was the first time that a grassroots trans youth serving family had made, made the move to higher education and um, onward and upward. 
But that's kind of the evolution uh, as part of trans history of what advocacy looked like for trans kids, youth, and their families specifically, as opposed to just being adult focused. It's impossible to talk about trans history, um, the hate and um, genocide that was committed against indigenous people 400 years ago, the cross-dressing, anti-cross-dressing law existed in the 19th and 20th century, um, the intolerance um, and hate that had an uprising in the 70s with the rise of the moral majority, um, backlash against people like Renee Richards. Um, it's impossible to talk about it without addressing what is really, in many ways, um, a golden age of anti-trans and gender diversity hate right now, particularly in the aftermath of the Supreme Court ruling in favor of marriage equality. Marriage equality was the hill that extremists, uh, right-wing extremists and Christian extremists were going to die on. And once they lost that, they had to turn their attention to some group that they felt was more vulnerable that they could equally oppress. And that group turned out not only just to be trans people in general, but in many ways trans children, youth, and their families specifically. So I first want to just address feminism. So feminism has gone through several different waves that people refer to. And the fourth wave of feminism, which many people think really arose in about 2008, um, came as a result of more attention and attunement to um, what happened with Occupy during the economic crisis, um, the rise of Black Lives Matter about the same time, um, the expansion of in environmental justice issues, techno literacy, and spirituality um, in the aftermath of the financial crisis. And fourth wave feminism was really um, defined in many ways by bracing of the sense of intersectional feminism. Um, there is no such thing, and sectional feminism believes that there is no such thing as an essential woman that is universally impressed. Intersectional oppressions that must be considered within the realm of feminism include all of the bullet points that you see there. And intersectional feminism, under fourth wave feminism, embraces transgender identities. Right? It's important to say that because out of the Janice Raymond book came this system called Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminism, TERFs. And they believe in the framework, the basic framework of fourth wave and intersectional feminism. They're all good with that, that's it. Except, you know, they think there is an essential woman and it's a biologically essential woman. And those don't include trans women. They also believe that trans men are butch lesbians that have just sold out to the patriarchy. make sure we're not confusing this topic. Sure. I know that, Miriam, what you're saying is you're not against people being trans. This is not a battle against a trans identity if people want to adopt that. That's this right. is very specific about saying because of that trans identity, our government, the laws, the social conscience right now seems to be shifting to say the one last place where women have felt that they have privacy, that they have some space, to be a woman is now in question of being violated, and that's why you've really risen up and said, I've got to talk about it. Yeah, I, I don't hate transgendered people, okay? I don't think they should be discriminated against. I think they should have the very same human rights that any one of you or any one of us here has. Okay, what I don't like is that they're co-opting my humanity and denying me the vocabulary that I use to describe myself they are denying me the basic human right of privacy. Further, I'm disturbed by what I see as the transgender communities, what's the word? It is an outreach, but reaching out to children. Um, if you go online, you will find that there are a number of parents, organizations, whatever, who say that their, their kids, their, their little kids are transgender. Um, I don't think so. I don't think children really know about stuff like that. 
and I think it's Munchausen by proxy or vile perniciousness. Um, even I might use the word pedophilia, and I, I know this may be hard for some of you out there, because this is dicey stuff, okay? It's touchy stuff, I know. But Sometimes kind of clarifying the language is important, because I didn't know any of this stuff before our, this battle found me. But I think a lot of us, when we use the word gender, a lot of us have used it as a synonym for biological sex. We would use them like the gender reveal for, for babies, right? Um, but like was already described, there's a separation now. And what the movement is trying to do is to say that biological sex doesn't matter in a legal sense, and that gender does. That's what's important, gender expression, gender identity. And what that looks like for women, uh, the way this is playing out, like let's, let's take Title IX for instance. Okay, so I paid for my college education with a basketball scholarship. There was recently a six foot seven male who identifies as woman, um, who took a woman's basketball spot on a women's basketball team. It's happening in weightlifting. There is currently a volleyball player who's trying to get on the women's Olympic team. This, um, and so when gender identity wins, I believe that women always lose. You're not gonna see a female, regardless if she identifies as trans or not, on the NBA, on, in the NFL, you're not gonna, women are gonna, it's a power dynamic and women are on the losing end of that. Um, and so when we're talking about compassion, I, I, I think that we really need to, to look down the pike a little bit more, because I think there's this, this, we wanna be loving to everybody, um, but it's not loving to embrace something that's gonna cause a lot of harm. I will summarize by saying there is almost nothing fact-based in any of the information that was just shared there in that video. Almost nothing. I think Miriam probably got her name right. But these are the arguments that are being perpetra uh, perpetrated and are actually being used as now political campaign arguments. Oh, if progressives get elected in, 2018, in 2020, um, trans boys are going to be allowed to take over girls' sports. Um, the transgenders will, will take over. So let's talk a little bit about the law. And now we're getting into some good news and bad news, right? In 2011, the, the, under the Obama administration, the Department of Education released a DCL, a Dear Colleagues letter, that informed and expanded the understanding and um, uh, interpretation of Title IX to include trans and gender diverse students, that it applies to trans students and that they should, uh, violations of trans students' rights and inclusion and access to care and to services and facilities would be a violation of Title IX. That came out in 2011. In May 13 of 2016, still under the Obama administration, OA, um, they repeated that declaration and said that the, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, um, working in conjunction with the Department of Education, would prosecute against local school districts um, or states violations of transgender students' rights um, under Title IX. So they reiterated the fact, Loretta Lynch went on TV to do this, it was amazing, to reiterate the fact that if you are trans and you're being discriminated against in your school, the Justice Department of the United States of America will be your attorney in prosecuting this. And we will threaten withholding funding from these school districts if they do that. One of the very first things that the Trump administration did, um, barely a month after inauguration, was to issue another Dear Colleagues letter that said, ignore the first one, ignore what they said in 2016. Um, we are no longer going to defend discrimination cases um, uh, at all. Um, shortly after that, Trump also just arbitrarily decided to ban transgender people from serving in the military. Um, and he, that got him a lot of support from evangelicals. There are a lot of people that believe that that was a deal that had been struck with him in exchange for evangelical support in the election that he would have to do, this would have to be one of the first things that he did. Uh, is to ban trans troops. Um, even though a RAND Corporation study that had come out earlier in the year, specifically looking at any compromises that might exist regarding trans people serving, said, no, minimal impact on readiness and minimal impact on healthcare costs. 
in February of this year, um, an Oregon case involving the Dallas, Oregon School District um, made it to the, or to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals um, on appeal um, that uh, parents had sued the school district because the school district had allowed transgender students to use the restroom matching their gender identity. And the local court had said, yes, that's, that's what school districts should do. The parents appealed it. It went to the federal appeals court. And the federal appeals court ruled in favor of the school district and the student. The opinion by Ju uh, Judge Tashima said the bathroom policy doesn't infringe on privacy or parental rights under the 14th Amendment or free exercise rights under the First Amendment, which is what the parents that objected to it claimed. Well, it's infringing on the rights of my non-transgender child. He said it also doesn't create actionable sex harassment. So that was a big win. That was huge. It's been a big year in 2020. In June of this year, um, the Supreme Court ruled that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 does indeed protect gay and transgender workers. This is fundamental change. In the ruling, Neil Gorsuch, surprise, surprise to all of us, said it's impossible to discriminate against a person for being homosexual or transgender without discriminating against that individual based on sex. An employer who fires an individual for being homosexual or transgender fires that person for tra traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of a different sex. An employer who fires an individual merely for being gay or transgender defies the law, and the law they're referring to is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The 11th Circuit Court of Appeals ruled in a case that made it to the Court of Appeals of a student, transgender student, Drew Adams, who was suing their school board in St. John's County, Florida. Again, about bath access to the bathroom that matched their gender identity. And the court ruled in favor of the student at the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. We see three constitutional infirmities with the school district's bathroom policy. One, the policies administered arbitrarily. The policy relies upon a student's enrollment documents to determine the sex assigned at birth. This targets some transgender students, but not others. And what they mean by that, and because we work with trans children and youth, we have children that transitioned when they were five years old. They never, nobody at the school ever knew they were transgender. They were not enrolled as a transgender student. So they would not be being discriminated against. But someone who transitioned later, who other people knew was transgender, would be discriminated against. So it's unequal. The school board's privacy concerns about Mr. Adams' use of the boys' bathroom are simply hypotheses. All of these, well, what if, well, what if, well, well what if? You know, what if a trans, what if somebody pretends to be a girl um, just to get in the bathroom and abuse girls? Or what if the trans person loses their mind? Or what? If? All of these objections are all hypothesized, uh, hypotheses that there's no evidence for. And the district's bathroom policy subjected Mr. Adams, the trans student, to unfavorable treatment simply because he defies gender stereotypes as a transgender person. A public school, and this is a reiteration of the earlier ruling from earlier courts, a public school may not punish its student for gender nonconformity. Neither may a public school harm trans students by establishing arbitrary separate rules for their restroom use. And then finally, and this happened at the end of last month, the Fourth Circuit Court, one of the most conservative appeals courts in the country. Um, and this was based on the Supreme Court's earlier ruling about Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, applying to trans folks, the Fourth Circuit Court used that finding as the foundation for their finding. And this is the case of Gavin Grimm, whose case became somewhat well known. Um, he was a trans, he, he's a trans guy who sued, his, began suing the school district because they wouldn't allow him access to the boys' restroom in Virginia. And it made its way to the local courts and the appeals courts. It made it all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, I don't wanna hear it. We're gonna kick this back down to the appeals court. Well, this was the appeals court that kicked it back down to. And the Fourth Circuit, Henry Floyd was the judge that wrote the opinion, said, at the heart of this appeal is whether equal protection and Title IX can protect transgender students from bathroom policies that prevent them from a offender. We join a growing consensus of courts. The answer is resoundingly yes. Quote, as articulated by one district court, one would be hard pressed 
to identify a class of people more discriminated against historically or otherwise more deserving of the application of heightened scrutiny when singled out for adverse treatment than transgender people. And for those that don't know, that is the trans flag. Thank you so much. I think um, Jace and Bob and everybody at the Standard for, for giving me the opportunity to spend this time with you today. And I look forward to seeing you all again.